here with the bust of Soren Kierkegaard uh, that I keep uh, right above me here at my desk. Uh, Kierkegaard is one of my favorite uh, uh, people uh, to return to. And one of the things that's uh, kind of frustrating about Kierkegaard uh, is the fact that there are so many misconceptions about him. And that might be one of the reasons why several of you asked me here for our Reading in Exile a series to talk about Kierkegaard and sort of where to start with Kierkegaard. Uh, one of the frustrations is having people who will think of Kierkegaard because he was uh, called an existentialist and because he influenced some of the atheistic uh, existentialists of the 20th century, Jean-Paul Sartre and, and people like that, Heidegger, that <clears throat> this means that uh, that, that Kierkegaard is the same sort of thing that they were, when that's uh, simply not the case at all. And anybody who spends any time actually reading Kierkegaard's work will see that. And so there, there are some people who see Kierkegaard as a friend who really shouldn't, and some people who see him as an enemy uh, who really shouldn't. And I see him as a friend. And uh, the other part that sometimes is frustrating with Kierkegaard is people will take a phrase uh, or two that they have heard from Kierkegaard. You can go on Pinterest, for instance, and see all sorts of uh, Kierkegaard quotes that are sort of packaged as almost self-help uh, sort of things that, that really are out of context with what he was saying. Uh, life is to be, uh, can be only understood backwards, but lived forwards. Uh, there's a lot more to that than what a, a Pinterest quote or an Instagram quote is meaning by that. Um, the other thing is the idea of leap of faith. Um, there are some people who use this phrase summing up what Kierkegaard is saying in order to act as though what Kierkegaard is saying is just decide to be a Christian and leap out into the dark in the way that uh, people also will caricature Blaise Pascal's wager as, as being essentially what he had to lose. Uh, that's, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that uh, you can't get to Jesus Christ by working your way through a syllogism or working your way through a trail of facts over which you can be expert. And so instead, the way that God has spoken to us is through this kind of contradiction of everything that we ordinarily see, which is exactly, of course, what Jesus has taught us uh, in, in uh, saying to us that it's not the wisdom of this world, that shame that God uh, brings to nothing the things that are in order to create what is. Um, so that's all a, a sort of a, a barrier to people with Kierkegaard. The other thing is He's really, really hard to understand. So if you just pick up Fear and Trembling or a concluding unscientific postscript in the, this, these are the Cambridge University Press texts or any of his uh, works, one of the things that you're going to find is it's confusing because uh, not only is he addressing uh, Hegelian philosophy and, and any number of other, uh, other topics, but also because he's writing under pseudonyms, uh, often from multiple different perspectives. Uh, so you're, you're asking, is this Kierkegaard saying this, or is he representing this viewpoint? How do you understand it? That's why with Kierkegaard, unlike most people, I would say, read this person's stuff before you read any stuff about him. Kierkegaard, I would say otherwise. If you're new to Kierkegaard, start with something... Uh, Two things you could start with. One of them would be this, C. Stephen Evans, Kierkegaard, and Introduction. It deals a little bit with his life. Uh, there are a lot of good biographies on Kierkegaard. There's a new one that's really good, A Philosopher of the Heart. Uh, but Kierkegaard's life is kind of sad if you just look at the, the life as it is lived. That's uh, why uh, people think of him as inordinately melancholy when he he really did have a, a remarkable sense of humor and even a sense of joy. Uh, but the life itself is, is sort of sad. This deals a little bit with, and his name's Kierkegaard, which means churchyard, which means graveyard. So, you know, you, you have that name, you're going you're gonna to kind of live up to it in some ways. 
Uh, this deals a little bit with his life, but also works through his thought. And so explaining to you, for instance, what uh, Kierkegaard means by the aesthetic, the ethical, and the religious, uh, which means more than just their words, uh, than what you typically think of in terms of those words and, and so forth. Just a really insightful, it's not very long, uh, but there's a lot uh, in there. The other thing I would say is pick up this remarkable little volume called Provocations, Spiritual Writings of Kierkegaard that was uh, put out by Plow uh, Publishing, the Plymouth, uh, or, or the, um, um, oh, the Brudenhoff, uh, who are this, this great Anabaptist community uh, in New York. They put out remarkable things, including a great journal, uh, Plow Quarterly. But this puts together uh, some of uh, some of Kierkegaard's writings, uh, talking about things as important as the crowd. Uh, some people think of Kierkegaard as inordinately individualistic uh, because he's constantly critiquing institutionalized uh, Christianity. But um, it, it's obvious why. It's obvious then. It's obvious now why. He talks about that pull toward the crowd where uh, where you simply become absorbed into the crowd. And he talks about what happens when Christianity becomes the default. So uh, Kierkegaard will say things like, <clears throat> apostasy is going to come in the world, <clears throat> not by everyone denying Christianity, but by everyone uh, uh, adopting Christianity. So that Christianity just becomes normal life. And so he, he talks about how when the authentic gospel is brought in, it's going to feel to people not like Christianity is being introduced, but like it's being taken away <clears throat> because that, that cultural established Christianity that they're used to is being confronted with the authentic gospel of Jesus Christ. Provocations, I can't, uh, I, I can't uh, emphasize how good that is. And then this little book, this is, um, a primary source here are the present age, <clears throat> especially this uh, this section at the end on the difference between a genius and an apostle. I first came across this years and years ago <clears throat> because of uh, uh, Walker Percy talking about it in Signposts in a Strange Land or somewhere. I, I don't remember where he first referenced it. And when I read this, it absolutely changed the way that I saw everything. I, I refer back to this constantly, where he says, there's a genius who comes with expertise <coughs> and can talk about something. And then there's an apostle who doesn't have uh, expertise. He's simply somebody who is sent and somebody who is bearing witness. And so there's an authority that is there. So it's a Mark one sort of authority that is not as those of the of the scribes and the teachers of the law. So on the difference between a genius and an apostle, I recommend it. And one of the things, <coughs> excuse me, when we live in this time where cultural Christianity is uh, with us constantly, you have this sort of collaboration and collusion often between a buffoonish, anti-intellectual uh, form of religion with a kind of uh, hyper-rational uh, sort of religion and they're in alliance with one another. Uh, Kierkegaard is really refreshing uh, with all of his personal problems and with all of his personal struggles to point backward to Jesus Christ and to say, look at him. That's, that's worth a leap into some of Kierkegaard's writings. This is Russell Moore. This is Reading in Exile. Let me know in the comments what you would like us to talk about here next time.